Hello. Hello and welcome to such a glorious evening. My name's Ann Turner and I'm the president of the MLC Old Collegians Club. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. The MLC Old Collegians Club acknowledges the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of this nation. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we conduct our activities, our events and programs. We pay our respects to ancestors and elders past, present and future, for they hold the memories, traditions, culture and hope of Indigenous Australians. The MLCL Collegians Club engages respectfully with Australia's Indigenous people, culture and country and is committed to continuous learning in this area. I'd like to welcome you all tonight. We have some special guests amongst us that I'd like uh, to um, uh, tell you about, or welcome in particular. Um, our Old Collegians Club patron, Anne Scott, OAM, is with us tonight. Our MLC principal, Diana Vernon. Our MLC, the MLC representative on our Old Collegians Fellowship Grant Selection Panel, Chris Wintle, is amongst us somewhere. Hi, Chris. Head of Senior School, Jennifer Bailey-Smith is with us. Hi, Jennifer. We've got two MLC um, prefects with us tonight, Raya Fordyce and Gabby Walker. We have MLC council members, advancement team, old collegians and guests. Welcome to you all and thank you for being here. We've got some, not surprisingly, we have some COVID safe announcements to make, or housekeeping if you like. The advancement team has asked me to remind us all of a few points here. Uh, the expectation of maintaining social distancing um, uh, where possible and to observe any capacity numbers in the bathrooms, please. The availability of hand sanitizer and masks from our COVID safe officer, Sarah, who's with us tonight. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Uh, and we've also been asked that when the event concludes at 8.30, if we could please depart um, on time and avoid any bottlenecks and crowding. So what a, I'm, I'm delighted that we can all be here in person in our first face-to-face um, -face event since this time last year. We, we did manage to squeeze this event in last year just as the, the, lockdown, the closed downs were starting to happen. So it's wonderful to be back in person. Um, each year with International Women's Day, I find it's a really great opportunity to reflect on the plight of women and, and what we've achieved individually and collectively and, and to consider the challenges that we've still got ahead of us. Uh, as I reflect on these incredible and unprecedented events of these last 12 months, uh, I think of women across the globe who are facing incredible challenges, uh, who are showing, showing extraordinary resilience and who are exhibiting a strength of spirit and generosity uh, in helping others that's both comforting and reassuring. A little closer to home, we have um, some very brave women in our corridors of power that are unfortunately having to um, speak up and make, make some, some noise, but um, thank goodness that they are uh, in, in the hopes of changing um, for the better how this country is, is run. So we are taking many small steps forward all of the time uh, and this is, so there's much to celebrate but still much to tackle and so many challenges ahead facing women. Uh, and I feel now more than ever that it's so important for women to be looking out for other women and finding opportunities for other women. So what a great opportunity for us to um, come together and celebrate on such an evening. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing from our guest speaker tonight, who's one of three amazing Old Collegians, helping to empower women through our Old Collegians Fellowship Grants. But I won't say any more about that for now, because we'll hear a little bit more about that shortly. I would now like to introduce MLC Principal Diana Vernon. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much, and a very warm welcome to everyone this evening. I too would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, 
and also acknowledge any Indigenous Australians with us this evening. Um, apologies, I should know by now, I've been in Australia long enough that I should always have my shades with me. And particularly being in Melbourne, I probably need my umbrella. I don't think that's forecast for tonight, uh, but normally one needs to prepare for four seasons in a day. When I left home this morning, there was absolutely no glimmer of sun on the horizon, so apologies that um, I'm squinting into the uh, rather fabulous uh, setting sun um, over this stunning view. Um, but as Anne has said, it really is wonderful to be here and to be here all together um, and celebrating International Women's Day 2021. Choose to challenge. Um, very important that we continue to progress and uh, progress the work that has been begun and that was started with the inaugural International Women's Day and even before that with the suffragettes uh, towards, the end of, uh, towards the end of the 19th century. Um, so if we look back over time, um, and as Anne has said, you know, there's much to celebrate. There is much to, there's much to look ahead to as well and to consider um, in, in the future as we continue to make progress. At the beginning of term at our commencement assemblies, I spoke to all of our students and I said, look, 2021 has started off really positively. We've got the first female vice president um, over in the White House. Uh, we were all mesmerized um, and uh, completely and utterly taken in um, and just, uh, it, you know, with this wonderful um, Amanda Gorman, 22, really not much older than many of our students, than our year 12 students, but, you know, any of our students really, in four years' time. Gabby? <laughs> Rhea? Anyway, there we go. You know, we were all completely and utterly, as I say, mesmerized and tantalized by uh, this extraordinarily creative um, and articulate young woman, Amanda Gorman, you know, at the, um, at the inauguration of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the president and the vice president of the United States. But of course, closer to home, we also had four female Australians of the year. I mean, what a wonderful way to commence 2021. The news recently from um, the uh, Gender Equality uh, Australia has not been quite so positive in that we had a high um, in 2014 in terms of uh, gender pay parity. Um, it's dipped a little bit in 2021, a bit disappointing, but overall the trajectory is really good. And, and I do think it's worth reflecting back, as I said, you know, right from that early activism of the suffragettes at the end of the, the end of the 19th century, really just asking to be heard and asking for recognition. Votes for women followed, you know, sort of 20 odd years later, there was a lot of pain along the way. Then, of course, there was a bit of a, um, you know, the World War, uh, World War I, World War II, ghastly time in history. But, of course, it gave women that opportunity to stand in for men who were out at the front. And women then really, it, that was quite a change, you know, a, a real change um, in so many ways because women were there. They were doing the jobs that men had always done. Uh, then, you know, obviously, there was just a little bit of a, a stalemate. But then, you know, moving into the 1960s, emancipation, and then the 1970s, you know, a much more active sort of feminism. But it was very much about women striving for equality for women. And it was only a little bit uh, later, well, we went through the 1980s and the sort of power suits and women's presence in the boardroom had to be felt with those great big power shoulders and high heels. And they needed that physical presence there to be able to almost sort of beat men at their own game. But it was only really as we've developed into the 1990s and the 2000s that actually recognition this is not, gender equality is not a women's issue. Gender equality is something for the entire of society. It's for the health of society, for economic success, and for general cultural and societal success that actually we embrace gender equality. And I'm absolutely you know, thrilled that, you know, that sort of towards the 1990s and into the 2000s, you know, men have really stepped up you know, on that sort of bandwagon, recognizing, you know, with clubs like the 30% Club to get 30% of women um, around the boardroom and that that's taken off worldwide. We've had more recent campaigns, the He for She campaign, for example, uh, you know, which was about 10 years ago now, but really saying to men, you know, this is, this is your role. You know, you as well can strive for something that's actually going to make society a far better place. And, you know, as Anne has already called out, you know, with each year, there comes more um, unearthing and recognition of what we all need to do. Um, I wrote to you today about uh, the, the recent petition that has really hit the headlines um, across Australia, and that is the Chanel Contos pe uh, petition. I'm thrilled and delighted that Chanel is a product of an independent girls' school um, because she's really 
uh, you know, she's being active. She's actually making a difference. So I wrote to you today just to reassure you about what we do as a college um, in terms of uh, providing that education, working with our students, um, and both uh, Rhea and Gabby, I know, will be able to talk to the program. Should you speak to them, they will talk to the program that they experience. But you know, it's con we continue to be on a learning journey as to how we can continue to improve that program to best provide you know, everyone, and it isn't just women, it's young men, of course, as well, um, with the knowledge, the understanding, and the expectation about respectful relationships. Uh, but all of this is an advance towards uh, genuine gender parity and gender equality. So it is very exciting to be here today uh, as principal of you know, such a fabulous girls' school, as you all know, products of this, um, of this wonderful institution, um, as we strive to continue to support all of our young women to be the citizens the world needs. So it is a real honor and a privilege to be here with you all today. Uh, I'm always thrilled and delighted to hear the stories of our old collegians. I'm particularly looking forward to hearing from Alana um, in a few moments. But before I do, I'm going to hand over to um, another Old Collegian, Alex Waddell, who's going to tell you a little bit about the Old Collegian uh, Fellowship, and then I know she'll be introducing Alana. But wonderful to have you all here and uh, to celebrate the achievements of our Old Collegians, but women uh, worldwide, and to strive for that wonderful uh, future of uh, gender parity and gender equality. So thank you all, and I look forward to speaking to you a little later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Alex. I'm the Vice President of the Old Collegians Committee and the coordinator of the Old Collegians Committee Fellowship Grant Program. Each year, the Fellowship Grant supports Old Collegians who are planning to undertake a not-for-profit venture that aligns with the OCC's values and promotes women's empowerment, female leadership, education, or a social entrepreneurship program. This year, we are very proud to introduce to you one of three fellowship grant winners, Alana Schetzer, and her social enterprise, Get Lippy. Alana is a freelance journalist who also lectures in journalism at Melbourne, RMIT, and La Trobe. As a journalist, Alana brings a wealth of knowledge and industry connections to her project, Get Lippy. Get Lippy is a social enterprise that sells a limited edition range of lipsticks to raise awareness and funds for organisations that work to prevent violence against women, especially women from marginalised groups and communities. Alana is an experienced journal, uh, journalist and copywriter who has spent the last 14 years of her career reporting on violence against women, social sexism and discrimination. And she's worked for a number of media outlets including the ABC, The Guardian, Vice, SBS, The Age and Women's Agenda. So now it is my great pleasure to hand over to Alana, who can tell you more about her part in the fight against domestic violence and how uh, we can support Get Lippy. Thank you, Alana. Thank you. Uh, firstly, I would like to, uh, to pay my respects and acknowledgement to the traditional custodians of this land. And I would uh, especially like to thank the MLC Old Collegians Club for inviting me to speak at this event. In many ways, I'm not necessarily the typical choice to speak at an event about women. Growing up, I very much struggled with the concept of girlhood and womanhood and what it meant to be female. To be honest, I just kind of didn't get it. I was what you would call your typical tomboy. I distinctly didn't like the pressure or expectation that I should do something or behave in a certain way based on something that I didn't have any say in. On top of that, I really struggled to form friendships with girls when I was a child, which made going to an all-girls school for my entire education an interesting challenge at times. In a lot of ways, I just didn't understand girls. I didn't understand why they wanted to be princesses. For my eighth birthday party, a fellow student attended as Belle from Beauty and the Beast, wearing a beautiful and voluminous yellow ball gown. I, on the other hand, dressed as my idol, Al Bundy, for married with children. <laughs> a man who openly despised his family, 
hated his job and for whom his greatest pleasure in life was making fun of his kind and well-meaning neighbours. I saw a kindred spirit in this man. I didn't understand why girls my age were interested in romance or talking about getting married or having kids one day. I didn't have any interest in wearing dresses or doing something solely on the basis that I was a girl. On the upside, instead of socialising, I had plenty of free time on my hands and I used it to read, which meant that for the most part, I generally enjoyed going to school because I loved learning. Attaining MLC has been a genuine privilege. Having access to a quality of education that is simply, was simply unimaginable for girls just a handful of generations ago. It's a quality of education that billions of girls across the world still don't have access to, to no fault of their own. I loved going to school. Really loved it. In fact, I loved it so much that at the end of year 12, I didn't go out to celebrate. I didn't party, I didn't drink, and I didn't attend schoolies. I was actually really sad, and to be honest, I felt quite lost when school ended. If I could have, I probably would have stayed at school forever. But while I had to move on, I took something with me, and it was my love of learning, a love that continues today, and it brings me great joy and comfort. Journalism is not something that I planned to get into. It's something that I fell into. It, but it is something that has played a significant role in my life, for good and bad. After university, I still wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do, but I applied for work experience at pretty much any place that would have me, from Clio magazine to tiny little publications that would have two members on staff. I got a one week uh, work experience um, opportunity at Melbourne Weekly magazine, uh, which many of you may remember. The free glossy magazine that was a staple of the Burundara and Stonington areas of the 90s and 2000s. After a while, I eventually won a full-time job. This was with Fairfax Media at the time. And I thought I'd continue to do lifestyle about gardens and interviewing interesting people. But in what was a rather rude awakening at the time, I was put into the news department. And all of a sudden, I was going to courts and reporting on crime, learning how to read government budget papers, getting to understand the microcosmos of neighborhood politics and reckoning with natural disasters. My first big story was the Black Saturday bushfires in 2009. I was already reporting on the Keen Lake, St. Andrews and Christmas Hills areas for more than a year prior to the fires, so I knew several people who died and others who had lost their homes in the tragedy. I continued to report on the aftermath of Black Saturday for the next 18 months, and my love of learning really kicked in. I researched and reported on death and grief, environmental destruction, and the science behind what made this particular bushfire so lethal the politics of the Royal Commission and efforts to rebuild, and the deep psychological scars left throughout these communities and their determination to hold on to what made those communities special in the first place. I eventually moved on to the Melbourne Times masthead, which focused on inner city issues such as drugs, public transport, and complex social issues such as homelessness. It was this experience that really planted the seeds of my interest and passion for social justice. Being exposed to people, entire populations of people, who face discrimination, bias, harassment and abuse simply because of who they are, their race, sexuality, native language or nationality, age and yes, gender, was a personal reckoning for me. Growing up, I thought that feminism was something from a bygone era a relic of the past. I thought the way the world operated was simply natural and normal, not the deliberate construction that protects and promotes one gender over the other. I was so determined to be a boy that I never thought about what it meant to be a girl. But while I know that certain privileges have protected me from some of the worst consequences of, of society's structured misogyny, I felt fired up. Um, to use some of my privilege to help other women. Uh, 
I worked at Fairfax Media for nine years, including five years at the age in the news and sports department, which is hilarious because I hate cricket. Like, they know that. I continued to develop my interest in social justice and I became more and more interested in exploring gender inequality. I approached, I approached writing sports columns through the lens of feminism, questioning the relevance of having women in skimpy outfits hand prizes to cyclists and asking the, the biggest philosophical question of our time. What came first? The audience for women's sport or TV networks willing to put women's sport on prime time? After stints in World News at ABC and Breaking News at Reuters, in recent years I focused on my academic career at the University of Melbourne and freelancing for national and international titles, exploring the complex web of social justice, especially gender inequality. The more that I have learned about how being a woman in this world is a precarious experience for some more than others, the less still I can be about it. The reason is simple. It just isn't fair. One person, because of their gender, is not more deserving of safety, protection, education and job opportunities because of another. And equally important, one girl, one woman, shouldn't be more equal than another girl or woman simply because of the luck of which country or family she is born into. While I have spent a lot of my own life feeling ambiguous about what it meant to be a woman, my feelings about addressing gender equality are clear and strong. Reports on domestic violence, sorry, reporting on domestic violence, the gender pay gap and the normalization of sexual harassment is something I will continue to do. But I'm soon, soon launching a social enterprise called Get Lippy, which has been supported by a 2020 uh, Old Collegians Club Fellowship. Get Lippy will sell a limited range of lipsticks in shades that suit all skin tones. The money raised will be going to grassroots and community organisations that direct women who have experienced domestic violence. Importantly, Get Lippy is focused on groups of women who are at higher risk of domestic violence and you often find it hard to find appropriate support, if any. This includes Indigenous women, elderly, disabled, trans, migrant and refugee women. We know already that the leading cause of death, disability and illness in women aged between 25 and 44 is violence perpetrated by a current or former partner. Domestic violence is the leading cause of homelessness among women in Australia. Between 2016 and 17, more than 72,000 women and 34,000 children sought help from homeless services. The financial cost of domestic violence against women and children is estimated at more than $22 billion each and every year. These women deserve safety, dignity and the right to live a life free of violence, fear and intimidation. Get Lippy will also roll out an extensive website presence that will highlight suitable support services currently available, publish articles exploring some of the most challenging and complex issues regarding domestic violence, and women from, um, uh, women from marginalised communities, and raise more awareness about the need for people to support women whose lives perhaps don't mirror their own. I am immensely grateful for the support of the Old Collegians Club, not just for the financial support that the fellowship entails, but for enthusiastically embracing the concept. During the interview process of the fellowship application, it was actually the first time that I'd spoken about it with anyone other than my mum or a friend, and to have people simply say, I think that's a good idea, um, meant the world to me. Today, I still have the heart of a tomboy. Don't let the dress fool you. It's all a charade. I spend most of my free time wearing superhero t-shirts and I still deeply admire El Bundy. Importantly, I have the relative freedom to express my femaleness in a way that does not threaten my safety or impact opportunities that may come my way. As women, we are united in needing to change the social fabric that today still openly embraces men as more important than women. But as women in fairly privileged positions, we should also be united in acknowledging that we have a duty and obligation to lift up and support women who have more barriers and more risks. Because as women, 
however you express it. We as individuals are not truly free and equal until we are all free and equal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alana. We have some time for questions, if you're happy to answer some. Will COVID safe share the microphone? Does anybody have any questions to kick us off for Alana? I have one. Um, what shades of lipstick are you looking at? <laughs> Alex, you asked the hard questions about feminism, and um, uh, yes, uh, so we're starting off with a core collection, and the idea was to make sure that they would be, you know, sort of common colours, suitable for all uh, skin shades. It's going to be a red, a pinky coral, and a sort of like a shimmery nude colour. By nude, I mean, sorry, but beige. Not nude, beige. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alana, if you've selected them, can you tell us about some of the grassroots organisations that you are thinking about working with? Yeah, great question. Um, look, I can't um, discuss that in detail yet because I'm still in discussion. But the, the goal of Get Lippy is to work with the sort of groups that don't get publicity, that, you know, a lot of these groups literally operate on the smell of an oily rag. They don't have the funding for a marketing or a media officer. Um, they are deeply embedded in their communities. They work directly with the women, so, um, so you know, they don't have opportunities to do fundraising, but I can assure you that they'll be very well deserving and the money will go to great use. Oh, I should stay here. No yeah. one else is coming. Yeah, Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I keep moving. Hi. Um, I'm really interested in the website and the publications you're going to put up about feminism and all of that. So I was wondering what the website is. Is it launched yet? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so the website is going to be getlippy.com.au. Um, it isn't launched yet. It's still just being tinkered with around the edges. Uh, we'll be launching soon with the lipsticks. The idea of the website is going to be three components. So there'll obviously be a sales aspect where you can go online and purchase the lipstick. There'll be a section for women who want to access um, information and help. There will be a blog component where there'll be articles, um, profiles, um, Q and A's, you know, sort of breaking down myths and sort of misconceptions about domestic violence. And there'll also be a section for um, friends and family who, you know, if you know somebody who may be affected by domestic violence, you want to be helpful, you don't know what to do or say, that will hopefully empower you to support the person who needs it most. Hey, um, <laughs> amazing, amazing, incredible. Um, I was wondering, so, like throughout your career were there ever like times where you found that like being a female like you were put a disadvantage or like opportunities you weren't given and like how you dealt with that and like were there conversations you would have with people to like make them aware that what they're doing wasn't right or anything like advice you'd give the short answer is yes the long answer is yes and um, i mean for example you know, I was already reporting on the areas that were hit by Black Saturday. Um, and I remember the day I went into work and, you know, things were crazy. And my boss sent a male reporter who was reporting on the next region, which was Whittlesea. And I just remember thinking, but because we're, we're very protective journalists, it's like, that's my area. Like, you know, things like that. Um, the interesting thing about journalism is that today, on average, there are more women in a newsroom, but men still dominate leadership positions and managerial positions. Um, and the thing about the sexism and the discrimination that occurs in journalism, as I'm sure every industry, is that it's very, very subtle. Nobody is explicitly saying to your face, yes or no, based on your gender or any other factor because of your identity. It's very subtle, it's very hard to prove. Um, so it's great that we are slowly having conversations, but I think, you know, individually, it's, it's hard to win your case, but collectively, at least we're starting to talk about it, which is um, encouraging. Thanks for that. Um, 
Besides from buying lipstick, what can we as old XMRC girls do to help you? Buy lipstick. Um, <laughs> there will also be t-shirts. Um, in all seriousness, you know, part of the, you know, the name is a pun, like I love puns. Get Lippy isn't just about lipstick, it's get lippy, it's encouraging people to talk. Um, you know, think about all the, you know, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, this is about discussion, this is literally something that happens in kitchen tables and then, you know, takes over the world. We, you know, often one thing about privilege, you know, yes, there are types of privilege, but it doesn't protect you from everything. Privilege doesn't, you know, there are still, just because you have money or you have a certain skin colour doesn't mean that you're not going to be abused or be affected by cohesive control, any of those things. So I, I hope that it, it, it prompts people to have conversations. Checking in with your friends and family, you know, looking out for the signs. Um, you know, and just be mindful of it, you know, domestic violence. And when I say that, I don't just mean physical, it is emotional, financial, sexual, um, you know, it can be difficult to spot victims and survivors can be very hesitant to speak out, but I hope that we just start being more aware and sensitive and kind to each other and be willing to listen to each other and buy lipstick. Thank you. Thank you. And just to add, if this has raised anything for you or you would like some more information in the meantime before the Get Lippy website comes up, um, you can contact 1800 Respect. You can also contact Lifeline or Beyond Blue. Um, also, if any of you are interested in or know somebody who might be interested in applying for a fellowship grant, we'd love to hear from you. So please um, come and find me or you can contact um, OCC at mlc.vic.edu.au. Thank you. So Alana, thank you so much for being you, for being the tomboy, for being fiercely proud of who you are. It's a real inspiration to see somebody that comes from the same place that we come from doing such incredible things and we are so proud to be just such a tiny part of the incredible work that you're doing. So thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much Alana, that was really fabulous to hear. Uh, and our applications are due on the 30th of June each year and um, I would encourage you if you haven't already to follow us on our social media sites as well. We've, we're doing great things in social media at the moment. We've got um, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn all happening so choose your social media platform of choice and, and do follow us there for all our news and events and programs and opportunities and, and everything that's happening. Um, that brings to the end the formalities of the evening but we've got plenty of drinks and, and food still so do, uh, do partake of those uh, and um, we encourage you to network with your fellow old collegians. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.